Tonight, Ukraine says that it has launched a major counteroffensive to retake the southern region of the country around the city of Kherson, which is currently occupied by Russian forces. Now, this much-awaited push comes after weeks of anticipation and preparation. Ukraine had been attacking Russia's supply routes in an attempt to isolate forces there. Both sides say that the other has suffered heavy casualties. However, these claims cannot be independently verified. Russia captured Kherson early in the war, facing little resistance from Ukraine. Well, for more now, I'm joined by Justin Crump. He is a military analyst and CEO and founder of Sibylline, a strategic advisory firm in the UK. Mr. Crump, it's good to see you again. Um, is this the start of that counteroffensive against the Russian military, which Ukrainian President Zelensky has been signaling now for months? Yeah, the situation is still confused, as battlefields tend to be. Um, but it certainly looks like uh, a much more significant offensive operation. So I think we can say um, it does seem to fall in line with what the president wanted. And of course, there was, uh, as we discussed before on the program, a timeline for Ukraine of uh, wanting to achieve um, something in Kherson before any referendum could be held by Russia, which is planned in September. So Ukraine's had this political deadline of doing something uh, in, in the region by September. Uh, so it does seem to all fall in line with that. And certainly the scale of what we're seeing is much larger than we've seen recently at all. Well, how much of this announcement then would you say is, is backed by the power of Western weapons versus this timing pressure on President Zelensky to take action? It's a bit of all of it. Um, Ukraine, I think, has obviously made great use of the Western weapon donations, uh, particularly the HIMARS and the MLRS rocket systems, uh, to disrupt the Russians. We've, we've seen that going on. It's intensified uh, in the region over the last few days. Um, they've also been husbanding a certain amount of the equipment they've been donated, and the limited amount of pictures we've seen from today show some of the Western-supplied armoured personnel carriers uh, being used in what appears to be um, quite a decent combined arms uh, attack by Ukraine, so using tanks, infantry, aircraft and helicopters and artillery all together uh, to have achieved at least a limited breakthrough in the Russian front, as far as we understand it. Now, obviously driven uh, absolutely like everything in warfare, ultimately it's an extension of political ends, but they've clearly sensed that there's a need for an operation and the possibility of succeeding in something uh, in Kherson at this time. We have heard today that um, near the city of Kherson, along uh, the front lines, Ukrainian forces may have found places where they can most easily degrade Russian defenses. I mean, have you heard anything like this? And it, if it is the case, would this be enough to put any segment of the Russian army on the defensive? I mean, if you think about the territory the Russian army has taken on the far bank of the Dnieper, it's about 100 miles wide, about 30 miles deep um, towards Mykolaiv and then Kroviri in the north. Uh, Ukraine had made a, a small inroad on that um, a number of weeks ago on what's called the Inhalets River, which form uh, a key part of that battlefield. And that seems to be where some of the breakthrough is happening now. now. That's right in the middle of the Russian lines, therefore. The bridges that Russia relies on to reinforce their troops have all been at least heavily damaged um, by Ukrainian longer range strikes. Uh, the Russians are relying on pontoons to get across the river, which is very slow, very limited. Um, and so they're certainly in this bad position with a river to their back, with limited ability to reinforce, bring forward supplies, mm. or indeed move troops back across the river. Uh, and with Ukraine potentially making inroads right in the middle of that line. And that puts a very strategic dam at Novokovka within reach, which is really important for Russia, and particularly the Crimean water supply. So it's an area that the Russians are going to be very, very sensitive about. And after weeks of shelling there and, and effective deep strike operations by Ukraine, obviously they've been pretty degraded. They've been expecting this blow to fall. It remains to be seen how far it will go. Um, but certainly the Russians are not in a great position at the moment. And, and we have heard though throughout this conflict that the Russian military certainly outguns the Ukrainian military. That said, just last week we had $3 billion in weapons from the United States, additional weapons announced by Washington. Is the Ukrainian military, are they emboldened by this? Do they know that their supply lines, if you will, coming from the West are, are guaranteed or maybe in much better shape than the Russian side can say? 
I think your last point's a great one. I mean, I, we see that Ukraine, obviously, with an imperative for national survival, um, has played a very good game for support and mobilised a lot of resources and certainly seems to have built up a, a force capable of trying an offensive like they are at the moment. Um, Russia, by comparison, is trying the same thing and building up what they're calling the Third Army Corps in Russia. Um, it's got quite high-grade equipment, but very low-grade soldiers from what we can see so far. So while Russia is trying to bring things forward, they have taken heavier losses. They've got very big systematic issues. By comparison, yeah, Ukraine, I think, getting stronger. And I'm sure it isn't taking military aid for granted, but they're certainly making extremely good use of what they're getting. Military analyst Justin Crump. Mr. Crump, as always, we appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you. Thank you. For more tonight, we want to pull in Bradley Bowman. He is the senior director at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He's also assistant professor at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point. Brad, it's good to have you back on the program. What do you make of the announcement that came from Ukraine today that a counteroffensive operation is underway? Thanks for the opportunity to join you. For the record, I'm a former assistant professor at West Point, but uh, I welcome the question. You know, I, I think uh, Kiev's clearly under pressure uh, to not just play defense and go on offense. That's certainly understandable given the horrible suffering that the people of Ukraine have endured. Uh, they have fought bravely with agility, and they've received billions and billions of dollars of assistance, you know, $13.5 billion from the United States alone since January of 2021. Uh, and they've put uh, those weapons to great use. Uh, they, they've held the line in the East, uh, despite some losses that have come at a high cost for Moscow. And they've started in some places uh, and you don't want to overstate it, started mm -hmm. to turn the tide a little bit in the south around here, Son. But this is all easier said than done for a whole bunch of reasons, including the fact that the Russians have been resupplying, reconstituting, and repositioning their forces as well. Uh, so while they have uh, taken a lot of hits and a lot of losses, and Ukraine has been targeting command posts, ammunition depots, and ground lines of communications, the Russians are going to fight hard in the south. And whenever you have river crossings involved, it's, it's definitely easier said than done. And Brent, when you look at this announcement, though, and what's going on, how much of this is about the Ukrainian military being well equipped now, thanks to Western um, weapons, versus the, the president, Zelensky, under pressure to take action? I mean, what's your opinion here? Uh, you know, it's a great question. I suspect it's both, right? I mean, the, the Ukrainians uh, from the beginning have shown a, a willingness to fight, uh, and, and uh, they've increasingly had the means uh, because of, of the supplies that uh, the U.S., the British, and now the Germans and others are, are providing, which is great. Um, in particular, the high-mobility artillery rocket systems, the 155-millimeter uh, towed howitzers, and other things that the Ukrainians, frankly, have used with tremendous skill. They've learned quickly how to operate these new systems, and they've employed them to great effect. And so uh, this has forced the Russians in many places to move Move their forces back, uh, which it makes their operations more difficult, and has made them more slow in resupplying their forces at the point of, of Ukrainian attack. And so this, you know, when you combine the agility and brave of the Ukrainians with Western weapons, I think that explains much of what we're seeing. But no doubt, Zelensky is under pressure to show results. There was one U.S. defense official who was quoted today as saying that this shows that the Ukrainians have an appetite now for progress on the battlefield. Now, now that implies that they are feeling emboldened at, at this moment. And do they have reason to feel that way? I think they do. I mean, it, you know, let's remind ourselves that, uh, you know, Ukraine defeated uh, the Russian assault on their capital. I mean, there's just no other way to say it. They defeated it. And so after that defeat, Putin decided to uh, bite off a little bit less. He bit, he bit off more than he could chew. And so just to focus on the east and south, he, he took all of Luhansk. He's trying to take the rest of the Donetsk region. And he's focused on the south, and he has his land bridge to Crimea, but he's under pressure there. And, and they've taken extraordinary losses, you know, at least 15,000 deaths in this, in this yeah. battle, far exceeding what they suffered in Afghanistan. The, the counteroffensive against Russian forces has been anticipated now for weeks or months. Would it have already begun if Western allies had been faster in delivering weapons to Ukraine, in your opinion? 
from the beginning, I've tried to call balls and strikes on, on the Biden administration's pitching here. And my, and my bottom line is this. They were way too slow in starting to provide lethal assistance to Ukraine. Uh, they lost valuable time from November to February, early February. But after the February 24th invasion, I think the Biden administration has performed admirably, unifying the coalition, strengthening NATO's eastern flank, and frankly, moving heaven and earth to get Ukraine the weapons it needs to defend Ukrainians, the weapons they need to defend their homes. And so yeah. I think there's some to criticize here and much to applaud. Yeah, well, you know, last week we had the news of um, an additional $3 billion in U.S. weapons going to Ukraine. The U.S., by far, Ukraine's biggest ally in this conflict. But we've got midterm elections coming up in November in the U.S. We've also got Chinese military maneuvers around Taiwan, more aggressive than ever. Talk to me about these Two factors. Are these two wild cards in, in terms of predicting continued U.S. military support for Kyiv? You know, it's a great question. I think both for the United States and for Europe, and I'd say especially Europe, you know, supporting Ukraine in the short term is one thing. Supporting them over many, many months or even years is another, especially as you start to have financial pain, high gas prices, energy concerns. And the United States, as your question implies, has global uh, challenges. Um, but, you know, I would just point uh, viewers to the fact that the U.S. Senate voted 95 to 1 mm -hmm. in support of adding Finland and Sweden to the NATO alliance. And so I think that is a big uh, defeat for Putin and a, and a resounding statement of support for the transatlantic uh, alliance for NATO. Bradley Bowman with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. As always, Brad, it's good having you on the show. We appreciate your time and your insights. Thank you. Thank you. Well, tonight, the U.S. government is urging a complete shutdown of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. And it has renewed calls for a demilitarized zone to be established around the plant. Fighting in the area has escalated, raising concerns about a nuclear disaster. Now, a team of experts from the International Atomic Energy Agency are now en route and are expected to carry out inspections at the facility in the coming days. Russian-backed officials say that radiation levels are still normal, but people living in the area, they have been preparing for the worst. The situation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant has set alarm bells ringing across Europe and around the world. Now the UN's nuclear watchdog has dispatched a team of experts to the site. Led by agency chief Rafael Grossi, they're set to assess any damage to the plant and inspect its security and safety systems when they arrive later this week. In Kyiv, some residents welcomed the visit. I think this is very good news. We certainly don't need another disaster at a nuclear power plant. And it wouldn't just be a disaster for Ukraine, it would affect all of Europe. I still remember Chernobyl. But others were more gloomy about what it could achieve. I'm not sure if the Russian authorities will reveal the full reality on the ground and if they will really allow the team to improve the situation. So I do not believe that there will be any real results. In cities and towns near the power plant, people are already preparing for the worst and heading to sites like this one, where local authorities are handing out iodine tablets to be taken in the event of a radiation leak. It's a preventive and prophylactic measure. You mustn't take the pill when you receive it. It must only be taken after an official notification from the authorities. We started the distribution last week. Around 8,500 people received tablets, including 2,500 children. While hopefully these tablets won't have to be taken, the standoff over Europe's biggest nuclear facility remains tense, and Moscow continues to reject international calls for a demilitarized zone to avert potential disaster.